well-being that it makes it difficult for them to function. The names Gertrude Maria Douglas and John Alexander Douglas do not appear on the claim form filed in the Supreme Court of Jamaica. It is as if they never existed, their stories never to be told. Well, their stories will be told here and the world will know their names and faces. This is the power of social media in the search for justice. Through this medium, our names and faces will come alive, reminding all concerned that we are not just names on a piece of paper in a bank statement, but living, breathing human beings affected by the actions or inaction of those entrusted with our care and protection. Since I was a child, I took much responsibility for my mother and siblings. And as I have grown older, myself raising a child as a single parent, I have come to better understand my own mother and the sense of frustration and helplessness that she must have felt. I now realize that while my mother had many challenges in life, her spirit was effectively broken by these banks, Barclays Bank PLC and National Commercial Bank, Jamaica Limited. On July 24, 2012, the Supreme Court of Jamaica will hear arguments from Barclays Bank PLC and National Commercial Bank Jamaica Limited that our claim is statute barred and therefore the courts should not hear our case. We ask that you watch and monitor the outcome of this hearing very carefully. There are only four claimants listed, Joy Eleanor Douglas, Marlene Angela Douglas, Jacqueline Erica Douglas and Ivan George Leopold Douglas Jr. But I like to think that Gertrude Maria Douglas and John Alexander Douglas are also there. I will now tell you something about our father, Ivan George Leopold Douglas. Ivan was from a working class family. Having been born and raised in Almontown, St. Andrew, to Father Joseph Douglas, who worked for the Jamaica Public Service Company, and Mother Maudlin Douglas, Nee Douglas, who was a housewife. He was the fourth of their five children. His family was Anglican, and from a young child, he came under the direction of the Reverend Cyril Swaby, the pastor of St. Matthew's Anglican Church in Almontown. Reverend Swaby was like a surrogate father and mentor to Ivan, directing his education to Kingston Technical High School, his studies in engineering in England in 1953, and his business development on his return. His business, Douglas Prefabricating and Construction Company Limited, was highly successful, involved in the construction of housing schemes, schools, and other structures throughout the island. Reverend Cyril Swaby went on to become the head of the Anglican Church in Jamaica, and his mentorship of Ivan continued until Ivan's death, at which time he personally organized and officiated at the funeral service and burial at St. Matthew's Anglican Church and St. Andrew Parish Church, respectively. Ivan met Edmund Law Robinson when they both taught in Kingston at Greenwich School. She taught there from January 1953 until September 1954 when she traveled to the United Kingdom to pursue further studies. Edmund was born in Colonel's Ridge, Clarendon to Rudolph Robinson, planter and tailor, and Teresa Robinson, Nee Robotham, housewife. She was the eighth of their ten children. In 1954, Ivan and Edma were reunited in London, England. They were married in London in 1954. The union produced six children. Daddy used every opportunity to remind us that he loved us. Together, our parents built a middle-class lifestyle. Yes, Jamaicans, some of you may not know, 
But in the 1950s and 60s, Jamaica had a growing, solid middle class. It was a time when there was real growth in the economy and young professionals could build a life that many of our children and grandchildren are struggling to attain and maintain. I pray that this country can get back to nation building real growth and development. At the time of their divorce, the matrimonial home was 3 Winchester Road, Kingston. Daddy also designed and built a country home in Cedar Valley, St. Thomas. Two of the children have died, the first and the last, Gertrude Maria and John Alexander. The anniversary of the death of Gertrude Maria in 1981 is particularly difficult for me, as June 18th is my birthday. Since her death, my birthdays have always represented a time to reflect on my life, ensuring that I live it to the fullest and with no regrets. Each of us will say something about how we felt about Daddy and our reaction to his death. As you can appreciate, we had already been traumatized by the divorce of our parents, and then came the death of our father. People react in different ways to stress and trauma. Some are emotionally and psychologically destroyed, and others are able to channel the experience and move forward, even with the pain. Then there are all the reactions in between. With professional help, some are better able to cope. Well, in our case, it was complete self-help as no brief counseling was provided. For Gertrude, I'm going to let our mother speak. The original passage is in Mama's own hand. I found it after she died in 2005 among some of her things that I had been keeping. It is a section of a longer statement that she wrote in March 1986 that I may publish in its entirety one day. I have omitted some statements made here, as after all, a court case is ongoing, and some of these facts may be raised in court. Gertrude, being soft and concerned, took it hard and became an epileptic. On several occasions, we approached representatives at the bank for help for her and got none. She was 25 years, 10 months old when she died. On one occasion, I went to, to ask for help and he refused. When Gertrude's illness was getting out of hand, Joy, my fourth child, went to the bank to ask for help for her, but was refused. I did not give up with her schooling. I could not keep her at St. Hughes for more than three years as she was a popular girl and always attracted the other girls in her form to the sick bay. I boarded her at Knox College where she spent one year. I took her away and sent her to a private secondary school where she settled down as Marlene, the next child to her, also went to that school and she became the headmaster's pet. After leaving that school, I sent her to Durham College, where she spent one year and did a commercial course and got a certificate. She later became a friend of the University Hospital and did the Red Cross training, worked at the nurse's library and the pharmacy at the hospital. She later took up church work and became a lay preacher. In 1981, she got a seizure and died before she got over it. All along, I got no help from the bank apart from paying her fees at Knox College. I had to get help from relatives to, to help me with the six of them. When she died, the bank offered with what I had from my credit union. I buried her at Shooter's Hill. Marlene says, I try not to remember and relive those times. I remember daddy as a hard-working man who was generous but strict, particularly with respect to schoolwork. He was very family-oriented, 
showed his children a good time and was always taking us to new places. I remember how he always resolved issues among his workers and united them. Upon his death, I was always depressed, particularly given our treatment by the bank. I think it is never too late for the bank to do the right thing. Jacqueline says, who was Ivan George Leopold Douglas? He was my father, provider, friend, confidant, and counselor. His death created a void in my life that took me over 40 years to overcome. I was not sure how I was going to cope, especially since our mother had an illness we did not understand. And knowing that he was there, it made all the difference. In his own way, he did the best a father who loved his children could do. He taught us good values, discipline, respect for the next person, obedience, and love. I don't recall him ever saying anything negative about our mother during their marriage and even after they were divorced. In fact, I remember him telling her that in spite of their divorce, she would always be his wife. He spent every evening with us unless he went overseas or was in the country working on a project. Sometimes he would come to visit even when we were gone to bed just to see if everything was okay and to say good night. I realized as I got older that daddy loved us very much. He took us to the movies on a Saturday evening at Harbourview Drive-In Theatre, took us swimming on a Sunday at Rockville Mineral Bath or Gunboat Beach on the airport road, fishing on his boat, crab catching during the crab season, trips into the different parts of the island, so we would not be ignorant about our country. Daddy was a teacher before he became a structural engineer, and he was very involved in our education. He interacted with our teachers and checked our schoolwork. As a child, I could communicate well with Daddy. He was a good listener and was very open to suggestions. He was disciplined, but he had the love that a father should have for his children. He made every effort to provide for us and to ensure that all our needs were taken care of. He had big plans for us, one of them being a university education. When he discovered that his life was being cut short, he gave us all the gifts he had been holding for us for birthday and Christmas. I did not really understand what was happening, but I felt that something was wrong. He allowed me to change my selection of high school and even bought me my first school bag for high school. He never got the opportunity to accompany me on my first day of high school because he became really sick. I remember clearly the morning the driver took us to school and not long after we got to St. Hughes were summoned to the principal's office and told that we would be picked up to go home. When the driver came, he took us to the Winchester Road home. We went upstairs and were ushered into a bedroom. The picture is so clear. There on the bed sat our father, as blue as the pajama he had on. His teeth were clenched and he could not speak. He just sat there, looking at us, talking with eyes. I could not understand why he looked so blue, but as I got older, it became